All right, we're going to get started. Good morning, guys. So uh, it's supposed to be spring, but it's pretty cold outside today. <laughs> but if you saw the weather forecast, it's coming, and we pretty soon will be complaining about mosquitoes and the humidity. So <laughs> it's all good. There's never, I always say, think that there's never been a time that spring and summer didn't come, right? And, and I always say, if I had a chance to move somewhere, I'd probably go north before I went south. I, I don't mind the seasons. I, I mean, there's lots of places in this great nation where it never snows, right? And so people hate it enough. Uh, I don't think Miami's ever seen a s snowflake, or if they have, it sure doesn't last long. Anyways, but welcome. We uh, are going to wrap up our section on, uh, let me get to the slide, on the doctrines of Christ and the Holy Spirit. And uh, we're going to talk this morning about the work of the Holy Spirit. And then we'll start section five, the doctrine of the application of redemption, next week of chapter 31, which will be common grace, which is a really great study. So let's start with our table discussion, as we always do. The question we're going to discuss is, have you ever been especially aware of the Holy Spirit's empowering in a specific situation in your life or a ministry? Just talk about that. If, what, uh, what are your experience with that as a, as a believer? I'll let you discuss that. Make sure you, uh, make sure you introduce yourself, and uh, I'll take attendance. Go ahead, guys. All right, guys, go ahead and wrap up the conversations. Let's discuss this a bit. How have you been especially aware or been aware of the Holy Spirit's empowering in your life in a specific situation or a ministry that you've been involved in? Where have you seen spirit work? Personally, corporately, thoughts? Teaching. Uh, I've been teaching for a long time. Teaching high school. So uh, just having seen the kids have the aha moment that things are so interconnected. It's not what you're saying. It's God with God. The Holy Spirit's working within them. Yeah. And them. Yeah. So, Good. Yeah. So, so you've seen those moments where the Spirit's working and the people you're ministering to or teaching, you see that actually happening. Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah, Good. Good. Awesome. Yeah. What else? I, I think it can be more daily than that. Um, you know, we were talking and, and, you know, we're all fascinated when we hear a missionary and we hear him talk about how just like God is just in their life every day. I think that's the spirit. And I think the problem we have is that we're so caught up in life that, that We've walked away from the God who wants to help us in every situation. I was telling him, you know, when I look at this in my life and I, I, you know, I'm often woken up now in the middle of the night my kids are driving it, and it's because I think the Holy Spirit is there, but the closer I am to God, the more I'm in the Word, the more I'm praying, the more I sense on a daily basis, like, I should pray for that person, or I should do something for that person. When I'm not there, then I don't sense that at all. And I think that's just the fact that I've walked away from the person of the Trinity whose, whose job it is to be there with us every single day, helping us in sanctification grow closer to Christ. Because I want to see people the way Jesus sees people, yeah. not the way I see people, which is, you know, get out of my way if you're on the road. Um, but the closer I am to, to the Word, and the more I'm praying and following you know, the, the, the definition of Scripture of how to be like Christ, the more this becomes apparent to me. And that's, in my sanctification, that's what I want. I want to be where every situation, I'm, I'm, I'm listening for the Holy Spirit to guide me in what to do. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you, you brought, brought up a couple, couple good points. points we, we, it's interesting, we can resist the Spirit, which is, you think about it, what an interesting concept that uh, we're going to talk about this, that the Spirit is not removed from us as followers of Christ, like we see in the Old Testament, the Spirit would come and go. But we can lose the blessing we have of when we are walking with the Lord and in the Spirit, that we do, we are more Christ-like, right? And we have those blessings. It doesn't mean that life is suddenly going well, that's the prosperity garbage, but it means that we are walking with the Lord and we more, uh, we, we sense all of those things that you shared. And we can... We can resist and miss out on those blessings too, and uh, it's an interesting, it's an interesting concept. It certainly is. Has anyone ever felt in a ministry just? We're going to talk about being led by the Spirit as well in a bit, but just that I need to go left or right. I'm sensing I should go right or I should do this. Has anyone had a situation like that? You know, you just felt the prompting of the Spirit to go ahead and, and do this. It, yeah. I was sharing with these guys. I don't know if this is exactly what you're talking about, but you know, I became a believer two or three years ago. And there wasn't like a moment where I really felt God like 
just you know say anything to me or anything like that, but yeah. I just anytime like the subject of prison got brought up, my heart would just break, and I really felt God pushing me towards prison ministry, and so I've served in a few different capacities with that. But it was interesting that before my conversion, I it, I never even cared, you know that. Yeah. Men were in prison, they have been failed by the world in all these ways, that could have been me. You know, to me it was probably just they made their decision, they're serving their time, and that's that. Yeah. And uh, once God had a hold of my heart, it was really different, and I saw them differently. And, I, you know, it's, uh, it's interesting how God kind of changed me in that way. And it, it was never like, a, you know, an aha moment. It was just clear that the Spirit was at work in my life because I had this heart change towards yeah. these people. Yeah. Yeah, and then without God's prompting of the Spirit. And then let me ask you this. I think we know the answer. Was that in your comfort zone? Um, <laughs> you, you know, to, when you're going to, to be totally going honest, to it was so clear to me that it was God mm -hmm. doing it that it made it easy to be there was no question. question. Yeah, uh -huh. so I was just like, you know, God's sending me here. I'm going. It, there was no, there was, you know, yeah. yeah, prison's not like this comfy. It would be nice to, you know, go minister to billionaires and high-rises, I guess. But, but you know what? Like, it when you know that God is telling you to do something, you just go. Uh, you get you get a sense, sense of calling, calling, the prompting of the Spirit, and you responded yeah, and in obedience. And to be honest, actually, I, like, if anything, it's, I'm very comfortable there because I know that Good. God has sent me. So, Good. yeah. Good. Yeah. Man, thanks. Great story. And sometimes the Spirit does prompt us to go. We, and he's sometimes outside of our comfort zone, correct? He's thinking about uh, getting up in front and talking to people. For some, it's terrifying. Back in... Hey, Years ago, that was terrifying to me too. And uh, but we feel that those promptings in many ways, you, and it's about our obedience. But we, I think, we get that sense as we walk with the Lord. If you followed the Lord for any period of time, that God is, you can feel those urge. And we can say that's just it's that nagging small voice. You can call it what you want, but as we walk with the Lord, we become more and more in tune to the leading and promptings of the Spirit to act, or you ever have the sense that I just need to go talk to that person, or I really feel like I should pray right now, I need to go ask them, if these, these, operative, these ideas pop in your head, I, I don't think those are random as we follow Christ to do the Lord's work. Those are the promptings of the Spirit. And as we pull away, as Pete said, we can miss out on some of those blessings where the Spirit does, we can resist that. And I think that we'll talk about that in just a minute. So let's do a little bit of background here first. So here's an overview we're going to talk about. Uh, the Spirit purifies us, He unifies us as a church. We receive power from the Spirit to do what the Lord has called us to do, like you need to go out and you need to be involved in prison and jail ministry, right? And before, the years ago, that would never have been a thought. It's a, why would I even care? And so that's a total transformation of your heart and your obedience, Scott. Uh, we're going to talk about that Spirit reveals truth to us. And it's interesting, the last point, the Spirit gives us evidence of the presence and blessing of God. We're also going to talk about what does it mean to grieve. The scripture talks about to blaspheme the Spirit. There is some really hard teaching from Hebrews uh, 10 and chapter 6 about blaspheme, blasphemy against the Spirit. We call it about the eternal sin. We talk about, wait a minute, is there's a sin that cannot be forgiven. There is some strong, strong warning that should make those in the church stand up and say, that, that, that can't be me. I hope that's not me. And we have that warning in the scriptures for the church. But here's what we do know, and this is important too. We know that Jesus promised the coming of the Spirit. We see in Acts 1 that John baptized with water. Jesus said, but you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now before he ascended. And then a few verses later in Acts 1, Jesus says, you will receive power when the Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to all the ends of the earth. So we know that, and this is, we're not going to talk about the Spirit's work in our redemption. That is coming for the next part. This is specifically when we think about our triune God. We've talked about what God the Father does. We've talked a lot about Christ. We've talked about the hypostatic union, fully God and fully man. This chapter is more what specific responsibilities and work does the Spirit do in the world and in God's people and in our lives. That's what we're focusing on because we know that in the Old Covenant, the power of the Spirit came and went upon God's people. So when we talk about being in the Spirit or being out of the Spirit, we're not talking about a removal from the Spirit if you're a follower of Christ. And we're going to talk more about that in coming weeks. I think that's really key to note that we are indwelt with the Spirit upon our redemption. Ephesians 1, Paul writes, "...in Him you also, when you heard the word of truth, 
the gospel of your salvation and believed in Him, Jesus, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance, and we acquire possession of it to the praise of His glory. God's Spirit's place in us, that sealing ministry is a guarantee of our salvation, when, uh, of, our, of our redemption when we are saved. And so the Spirit never leaves us, but... We also know the Spirit can give and withdraw blessing. We can, what is it, we'll talk about, what does it mean to, uh, to resist the Spirit? And uh, we'll get into that in just a bit. In chapter 14, we studied the Trinity. We talked about God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. And it, it's interesting, when we, what do you think about, I don't have to, we're not going to answer this in a group, but when you think of the Spirit, there's an error, I think, sometimes. We think of this as just this mystical force. We know God the Father, we know God the Son, but we worship a triune God, and sometimes we have this hierarchy. We have God the Father and Son, I get, in the Trinity, but the Spirit is just this sometimes mystical force that does this behind-the-scenes work, and we don't view the Spirit as part and equal as fully God and in that Trinitarian view. So we have to be careful of that, and um, it's, uh, that we don't fall into that as well. And that's a discussion question hopefully we'll get to in the end. Uh, and again... Um, this chapter addresses just the specific work and action of the Spirit. We'll get into much more what the Spirit does in working in salvation and our redemption in the weeks to come. So let's start first with we know the Spirit purifies us. And I hope, again, it's another, if you, if you got to read this chapter, it's another one where you're reading and you just pause for a bit and you thank God's Spirit for doing this work within us. I don't know if you got to read this or not. There was a lot there. I didn't want to do this in two, two weeks. I tried to condense a ton of information into a short period of time. But I hope as you read this, it just again, you're reading this and you just stop and you think, thank you, Spirit, for doing that work in my life. Because, and again, if you follow Christ for any amount of time, you know you can look back and see evidence of the Spirit in your life. And we're going to talk about Galatians 5, 22 and 23, the fruits of the Spirit. So we know the Spirit cleanses us from sin and the Spirit sanctifies us. And John 16 says, and when He comes, He will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment concerning sin because they do not believe in me, concerning righteousness because I go to the Father, and you will see me no longer, concerning judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. But when the Spirit comes, He will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. And that's what the, the, the purifying work of the God's Spirit does within us. We know the Spirit does the initial cleansing work at our salvation. And again, we'll talk about more of this in detail in weeks to come. But Paul writes to in 1 Corinthians, And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. And again in Titus 3.5, He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of God's Spirit, the Holy Spirit. It's the Spirit that breaks that pattern of sin in our lives. And we'll talk more about that purifying work and that cleansing the Spirit does in our redemption. Again, that's going to come in weeks to, in, our next, in our next section. We know this too as the Spirit, Spirit purifies us, that He also produces growth in our life. And that's that process of sanctification. Everyone, I want everyone to think back, however long you've been a Christian, whether just a couple of years or since you were a child or you've grown up in the church, think back just to, just go back 10 years, 20 years, if you've walked with the Lord for, a num, for, for, a, for any period of time, and just think back to that work. When you look back to that, I, I, I'll just be personal. I think I'm going to go back 10 years, 20 years, and I think you would agree with me. We think back to the man I was. I can look back and say I can see very clear evidence, very clear evidence. If, and I can just ask my wife about that clear evidence. She'll be happy to testify to that too and say that I'm not the man I was 10 years ago, 20 years ago, Five that I can see that pattern of growth. It doesn't mean that I don't make my mistakes I fail, we still fall to sin, but I can see that growth from where I was, and that's that Christian maturity. That is the work of the Spirit to develop that over time, and, that's, and I think we could all say that. We can look back and say, I'm not the man, I'm, and I hope by God's grace, five years from now in the future, I can look back at this point in my life and say, I'm not the man that I was, because God continues to do that sanctifying work within me. That is the work and response of what the Spirit does as He produces growth in our life. So let's... Here's Galatians 5, 22 and 23. And sometimes, this is one of those passages that through familiarity, it kind of loses its impacts. And so I want to stop on this for just a minute because I think it's good for us to park here for a few, 
and discuss this. The fruit of the Spirit is this, the fruit or the work of God's Spirit. We always talk about that fruit of the Spirit and not think what that means, right? The fruit of the work the Spirit does in our life are this. Think about this. This is what the Spirit produces within us as followers of Christ. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, well, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Because here's what we know, men, and we're going to discuss this for a minute, is this. And I'm going to speak for myself. That without the work of the Spirit, I'm the exact opposite of every single one of those, right? And all of us are. Because, because of sin, it is impossible for us to have a spirit, to be truly loving, to have joy, have peace, patience, kindness. I mean, if you think about the opposite of each one of these, not having joy, being angry all the time, having unsettled, no peace, impatient, unkind, not doing anything good within me, being unfaithful, being gentleness, eh? You're quick to anger, quick to say harsh words, quick to react violently, zero self-control. That is what the human condition is without the transforming work of God's Spirit to change that, right? So just stop for a second. Let's discuss this. Think for a moment first. Where have you seen God's evidence of God's Spirit working within you? For those of you who have kids, there's no greater joy than watching your children and looking for evidence of God's Spirit working in their lives. Again, we see plenty of evidence that uh, their, their sinful nature too. Trust me, that's always there. But I remember, I can think back to points where I would just thank the Lord for I saw evidence in my children or my son and thank God that's you working. Thank you for that. It's, uh, it's, it's really a blessing to see. But let's just talk about ourselves from where have you seen God's Spirit specifically work in your life? It can be recent. If you're going back five years, ten years, think about that for a minute. Let's discuss this at our tables because I think it's good for us to contemplate this because this passage should never become common because that is incredibly powerful. This is what the Spirit's doing in each one of our lives as we walk with the Lord. So let's talk about that for a minute. Where have you seen evidence of God's Spirit working in your life? Go ahead and share that at your tables. You know, people, there's lots of discussions we can do and say and talk about it, the existence of God, the reality of God, and I think personally in this, hey, boy, these are good discussions. I hate to interrupt <laughs> you guys. I started something great. I wish we had more time. <laughs> you know, I, I, I say God exists because of this, because I know the work that has been done is absolutely miraculous. It wasn't me, and I'm not the same person I was, and I know who I am without the Lord. And so what an amazing thing to say, this is why people say, well, come on, that's kind of, that's a circular argument. You're just, it's a, it's, a, it's a statement you're making on your own. I said, yeah, I am, because you don't understand. I, God exists because of this right here, and I, I'm, I'm a perfect living example. Yeah. That's a powerful statement that you said. That when you read that, and you say, I, I have more you know that God is at work, because it's totally the contrary the to the what we are trying to do too much or yeah. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. So it's... <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I tell my children all the time, if you have any blessing about being part of our family or, or as your mom and dad together in our marriage, or just if you have any joy or peace, or in, don't thank us, don't thank me, you thank God, because I, <laughs> we wouldn't have any of this. And I'm not a good father, I'm not a good husband, I'm not a good anything outside of God's transforming work. So all of these things we know, and some of you I know I heard shared some personal stories here too, of God's, of the Spirit's transforming work. Because all the things that make me a husband that brings honor to God and my wife, and a father brings honor to God and my children, or a man at all, are all these things that are miraculously done through the Spirit, because that's not us naturally, because of sin, none of it. We're the exact opposite in every way, and that's, the, that's just the ugly reality and truth. And yet we can look back, and this is why I love, here's what Paul writes to Corinthian church, with, and when we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, were being transformed. There it is, into the same image from one degree of glory to another. And this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. And again, another proof of our Trinitarian view that the Spirit is part of the Trinity and God Himself. And I love that. We are being transformed. This is the transformation as we walk with the Lord and the Spirit 
changes us that we should see. Any, anybody want to share just a, a story? I know there's a lot of talk. Anybody, any thoughts on this? And you don't have to. Somebody shared some personal things. We could probably pick any one of those nine and tell a story, right? And if we, uh, if, and it'd be interesting to get feedback from our wives, those who've known us for a long time, who've lived life with us, to get their perspective on this too. They could say, yeah, you're doing okay <laughs> in a few of those, but you, you, <laughs> you got some work to do. Let's move on from that. That's okay. <laughs> 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 Maybe just pick one of them, once a week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we want to come back next <laughs> <time>. <laughs> uh, but in all sincerity, just what a hey, so thankful to God for that transfer performing work that uh, I'm not the man I was. And again, I take no credit for that. I know who I'm at. I know who I am without the transforming work of the spirit. And so do you. And it's ugly and not pretty. And yet here we are. We can that's this is God's blessing in that transforming work. And we fail at these. I fail at all nine of these. It, it's uh, unconstantly, right? Uh, but God continues to do, transform us from one degree of glory to the next as we walk with Him. And that's uh, what, a, what, a, what a powerful truth and a great blessing that is. And so as, as we know the Spirit continues to produce growth in our lives. And here's a, I wanted to, He brought this up. What does it mean to be slain in the Spirit? We've talked about if you come from a Pentecostal, a charismatic background, that's common practice in worship. And I threw this on here just because, and again, I, out of fairness, Benny Hinn... There's a lot of Pentecostals that would not hold to some of this theater that's happening on a, on a prosperity gospel, give me your money stage. Uh, but being slain in the spirit, anyone ever heard that term? What it means to be slain? It means to be a, a, a rushing and empowering of the spirit that causes literally just overwhelming, that you're falling down and uh, you're, if, you follow, if you're a Pentecostal, you'll be speaking in tongues, not tongues as we see in Acts 2, but that uh, ecstatic utterance. Basically, it's God feeling the spirit feeling and God worshiping himself using you as the medium. Uh, but uh, here we'll talk. So this is this is slain in the spirit to a, a, a terrible degree. You know what this is? This is WWE from the church. This poor lady, oh, she has an attorney. <laughs> it's not just shoes off. I don't know if you've watched some of these guys. I mean, even the poor handlers got knocked slain in the spirit with that many. Enough of that. Uh, oops, that's not what I wanted. That's what that slain in the spirit takes to when we start, it becomes more of a theatrical. And anyway, that is, uh, that's, uh, it, it's, we've talked about being slain in this. We don't find that, that uh, verbiage in scriptures at all. And again, that's when we get into Pentecostal doctrine. And we see, I've, I've watched Benny Hinn use the old, he takes and blows on the whole audience, the first nine rows fall back. Hey, that's, uh, that's something different entirely. Yeah, question. Watching something like that, the f response comes to me that, Thank you, Lord, that I wasn't blinded to that degree to fall for something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Because, there, I mean, there's all kinds of stuff out there. Yeah. And we can just marvel at, you know, how, you know, God's Word just sings and jumps off the page. Yeah. Uh, and so we know it's true. Yeah. And then you see something like that, and those people are looking for something. Yeah. And they sure have not found. Well, the prosperity gospel is appealing to millions of people around the world, right? To follow Christ and you get a Mercedes. Yeah. I would not have been as generous as he was with regard to this possibility of slain in the spirit being real. And his footnotes in here, you know, you look up each instance and it's like, now nah, that's, that's nothing like what you see on TV. So most of this, to me, most of this slain in the spirit, 99.9% .9 of it is really bad. Yeah. 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 I, didn't I didn't look at the footnotes on this. Yeah. None of the examples in Scripture look even remotely like that. Yeah. Yeah. Except maybe the one where Jesus is in the garden 
and he says, I am, and everybody falls down backwards. And guess who falls down backwards? All the people who don't believe. So, yeah. You know, the guards yeah. and stuff. And that's a DNA opening a bit of a can of worms, we get into Pentecostal and charismatic doctrine because when we talk about speaking in tongues and being filled with the Spirit, they have a different belief than we would hold to at Village Bible Church, non-Pentecostal churches about what that means. And um, we can, that's a topic probably for another time. Uh, we also know the Spirit unifies the church, and this is amazing too. Think about a church, what a church is, the called out ones that we gather together and can be unified coming from all different ethnicities, backgrounds, beliefs. Think how different we are to come together and we are known and bound together by our love for God and that we can actually fellowship, worship, and serve together. So Paul writes in uh, Ephesians, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. There we go, because we know, again, the work of the Spirit. Think about in the church. I mean, the, we... We, yes, is there conflict in the church? Yes, but that is unfortunate because that's sin. But what marks us is our humility. That's not natural to humans. Our gentleness, remember the few fruits of the Spirit, that's not natural for us. Our patience, bearing with one another in love, yikes. We're not going to do that without God's transforming work either. And what we do, we, the Spirit is eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There's one body, one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. And Paul continues to write, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit as he wraps up the book of 2 Corinthians, be with you all. It's that work of the Spirit that even just bonds us together as a church and so that we can come and, and, and love and serve all the one another commandments. We do that in the context of the church as we gather together. And it's just amazing because that is the work of the Spirit that even not just transforms us personally, but even we can come together as a church and we can actually get together as a body and with all of our differences and beliefs and polity and everything out there, we still come together and that's the Spirit's transforming work in the body of Christ. And that is really, think about what's so, think of those of us who are out there in our jobs and we all know the office politics and all of these things. Think about the secular organizations versus the church, and they should be completely and absolutely different in the way that we interact with one another, right? If not, there's a problem because the church should look very, very different than any secular organization out there in the world. And we know how quickly sin can come and even destroy a church too and tear it down, but that should not be what the hallmark of the church is. We should look very, very different than the office out there, than any other uh, secular organization. We certainly should. That is the work work of the Spirit. What a powerful testimony the church should be because people should look at the church and say, something's different there, right? Wait, what's going on? How can you guys treat it? What, how is this possible? It should look very different. That is power of the, that's the power of the Spirit. Please. But I'm curious, when you talk about that, like as a leader in the church, when there is division and there is, you know, um, you know, someone's ticked off about something the pastor said on Sunday or what, you know, if it, when it gets to a point where you start seeing schisms, if, whether for like one person or groups of people where they're really angry about something and there is like a broken something in the church, how do you fight then for unity? What, what you know, how do you, how do you uh, contend for instead of just a lap, well, okay, go to another church kind of thing, you know, right? Yeah. Like how do you kind of lean into God there and, and try to, mentor people through that instead of but just allowing our humanness to lead us astray or, you know, yeah, good question. question. Yeah, I think um, there's a lot of principles in the church, and let's just apply that to our personal lives. Let's go to our family. Let's go to our relationship with our wives, and then when there is a, we fail, correct? And we fail each other, not just us, we, we bag, but our wives fail too. Is, and when there's a broken relationship, we need to go and in humility, there needs we need to be talking. What do we do? We talk. Very frequently, we're asking for forgiveness, right? <laughs> but there is we we need to go. We talk. We ask for forgiveness, and we try what we can to to uh, repair those relationships, right? And to have those conversations in the church, it's the same thing. Is that we're going to have times where fellowship will be broken because of human nature, sin. We offend each other. We we don't meet each other's expectations. And we need to be able to talk those things through. And I'm not talking about sin like in Matthew 18. 
because Jesus lives, lists four very distinct steps what to do with unrepentant sin. That's not, that's a separate step. And really that's prescribed. There's four, in Matthew 18, there's four distinct steps we do to deal with sin in the church that's unrepentant. This is more broken fellowship, broken relationships, and we need to have the humility, and I'm talking from leaders to, to everyone to say, if we made a mistake, whoever's made the mistake to go, and that's why we leave our, alt, we leave our gift at the altar, go make it right, and then come back and we fellowship worship. So we say that before we take communion is if you uh, have a broken relationship with a brother or sister, go make that right first before you come and partake because that's important that we maintain that bond of fellowship. And so from a leadership standpoint, we wanna make sure to try our best to facilitate that when it happens. And let's be real, I, as a father, I've apologized to my children, right? I've made mistakes. I have to go to my kids and say, hey, hey, you watched your dad, I, I, I shouldn't have said that. Those are harsh words. I shouldn't have said that to your mom. I wish I could take, I'm sorry. Would you please forgive me? You know what, I, I, I responded to you in a way I was angry, I'm sorry. The church leaders need to have that same level of humility as well to be able to go, and we made a mistake and that happens. To say, but that, that applies to everyone. And again, I think it's humility. It's that humility, I, I, I love this, humility and gentleness, that's key. Because we all know what churches where the hallmark is not humility and gentleness, not just from people, but from leaders. And that becomes, that's dangerous. It really is when it becomes about power or prestige or about the person and our pride gets in the way. Yeah, good well, question. The only, thing, the only other thing that I would add to that would be, uh, I think there's a lot of times when we get focused on uh, the second, secondary or tertiary things of, of, you know, whatever the issues are, right? And, and so much of, of broken broken relationship is based on on these secondary things and I think bringing back you know what are the things that are most important you know our belief in who Jesus is you know our fellowship with one another and, and focus let's start with these things that we know that we agree on and uh, and then we can move from there you know and instead of uh, emotional or uh, secondary or tertiary Right. Right. We yeah. all know that preference is decimating the church, right? I mean, I, let's say, okay, we just did a remodel in the sanctuary. I don't know if black and gray are everyone's favorite colors. I'm colorblind, so I don't care. Uh, but to some, that's really, I just, if I, but we all know those are secondary issues. I, we, I, we have our preferences about the songs and the worship and the preaching style and this and that, and colors of this, and the chairs are too big or too wide where the pews go. Uh, the drums are too loud, this, and we get it, it's, all, but these are all secondary issues. And is there, a, is, there a, is there a time when someone may leave the church? Is that appropriate in some? Yes, we know there is a time, but that should be a very difficult and hard decision because just as a family, we, ha we, have, we have our conflict, but we come together, and this is the hallmark of what we do. It's, again, we always try to mend and resolve those relationships because that's who we are and that's we are the called out ones that we are all the fellowship that we have that's always our goal is to resolve when possible but there comes a time when yes people will leave a church and there's reasons for that I understand that but that should be a very hard and difficult decision with much prayer and again in our country I mean right here there's if you people if you don't like one church you can drive what within 15 minutes you can probably point you to another four or five churches here that you're gonna get a good gospel message and so it's easy to go to another church too, um, but that shouldn't be, it should be a hard decision. Okay, this is a quote from Grudem, and this should be true of all of our relationships. When the Holy Spirit is working strongly in a church to manifest God's presence, the church community will be in beautiful harmony and overflowing with love for one another, right? And that's really what it should be. I would say that's true. It should be true with our families, correct? And our, and our relationship with our wives our personal relationships, that this should be true of all of our relationships, but certainly as the Holy Spirit works, we see the fruit of the Spirit, and that would be a hallmark of the church, right? And we know that uh, because of us, people, we know that we can hinder that uh, because of our sin and our, and again, pride and sin, all these things, and that can get in the way, but that's really, I think that's true and true of all of our relationships. The Holy Spirit empowers us. The Spirit gives us life. We'll just go, let's read the John 6. It is, it is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. We know that, right? Um, the words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. It's the Spirit who gives us life. Let's read Titus 2. He saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy, by the washing, regeneration, and renewal of the Holy Spirit. That's what the Spirit does. It empowers us by giving us life and gives us power for service. 
empowers us when we get called to go to prison or jail ministry, whatever God's called us to do. We see these examples in the Old Testament uh, as, as well as a new, let's just go look in the life of David. Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. This is when he found David, the little shepherd boy, went through all the big powerful brothers. Anybody else? Well, I got this kid out there in the fields. And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. And so God empowered David through the power of the Spirit to do what he had called him to do. And um, we see Isaiah 61, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, and empowering him to speak, to speak the prophecy and truth. And uh, we see that even in the examples of the, in the Old Testament. Uh, we see that uh, in the judges, uh, Jephthah, what a, what a strange, sad story the judge Jephthah is, and that whole story, the daughter of Jephthah. But uh, we see God working in Gideon, very flawed leaders. Yet God still worked, and uh, again, we see that power of the Spirit, giving them power as God called them to, to lead and to be judges at that time. And then we still see that in the New Testament as well. We read the Acts 1-8 passage, you'll receive power when the Spirit has come upon you. And then, uh, and my speech and my message, Paul writes, were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. I think what a great practical verse for us right here, isn't it? Is that uh, it's not my words of wisdom that are... That are a career that are doing the work of God it has nothing to do with it. It's not because you're, we're eloquent or we have to have the right words. It is a demonstration of the Spirit and God's power that works through us. And this is why when we do share and stand up for the truth, when we share the gospel, we always think what? I'm, I'm going to say the wrong thing. I'm going to look foolish. They're going to ask me a question I can't answer. But the reality is the words of wisdom have nothing to do with it. It's our obedience that matters. We open up our mouth to speak in obedience. God uses that because Isaiah promises that word never comes back void. And so we have that promise there. And this takes the pressure, but it, we, need to, we need to obey. And when the opportunity arises, when we see the opportunity and need, when the Spirit guides us to open our mouth, then we do it. And so it is God who works through us. Uh, these are just more examples from the New Testament about uh, God, that the Spirit is the one that gives us power for service. We'll just go through this. We'll, uh, and we know that we'll end with this section, that, that, that power still is applicable to us today. The Spirit's still working us, even now as it was in the church 2,000 years ago and has. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says today, if you hear His voice and the Spirit also bears witness to us, this is happening even now. The Spirit continues to work in us, just as we see examples in the Old and New Testament. We know that the Spirit reveals truth to us. Uh, Peter writes, For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, right? Uh, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Spirit. It is God through the Spirit that reveals truth to us. That's uh, when we speak, the prophets, and uh, that's, the, that's the Spirit work, that He does reveal that truth to us. Uh, Paul writes, which was not made known to the sons of men and other generations, as it has now been revealed to his apostles and prophets. We know it's by the Spirit. And I put Luke 2 up there because I just love the, the story of Simeon, right? Uh, what a great story is. He's waiting for the consolation of Israel that he wouldn't die until he, until he saw. And that was in the, it just says in Simeon that the Holy Spirit was upon him, that it is uh, God had revealed that to him. That is through the power of the Spirit. And God continues to do that uh, through us today. And so when our eyes are open, it is the Spirit revealing that truth to us. As we study, as we open the God's Word, as we pray for wisdom, the Spirit empowers us to open our eyes to understand more and more of the truth that is right here in the Scriptures. We also know we talked about this earlier, the Spirit does guide and direct us. And Grudem had a whole conversation about what to what level that means. Like every aspect we do, if I pull it to a stoplight and looking for a route, do I take the left? Do I go left or right? Is that the Spirit guiding us? And uh, no, that's not really, I think it's much deeper than that. But we know the Spirit does guide and direct us. So some examples from Scripture. But I say to you, walk by the Spirit. You will not gratify the desires of the flesh. And uh, a few verses later, and I say, walk by the Spirit. I think I just copied that twice. Uh, but Romans, let's go to Romans 8. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. So what does it mean then to be led by the Spirit? We know in Acts 16, we see example of... Uh, uh, let's see, and they went through the region of, they went through the regions, but having been forbidden by the Spirit to speak the word in Asia. So the Spirit, they had some work and knowledge. The Spirit said, nope, don't go this way, go this way. So what does, how does the Spirit guide us then in our daily life? What does that mean? Thoughts on that? How do you, have you noticed or where, where have you, you seen, seen God, God guiding you in your daily life? 
through the Spirit. There are, there's those moments where you, you feel like you are supposed to go talk to a certain person or pray with them or whatever. I think those are those times where the Spirit's moving us and it's, it's our responsibility to, to listen to that. Yeah. 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 That I, so I think it's not talking about the mundane of do I turn left or right at the intersection, correct? I, I think it's more exactly that we do have that he does guide us and he reveals that truth to us. Really, he's, when we feel that and we can resist that too and miss that blessing as well. And again, not outside of God's sovereignty, but we can. And, uh, but I think you're absolutely right. Other thoughts on that or questions? And I love this too. The Spirit gives us assurance. And I think this is a great passage. I'm going to go ahead and read this. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons. I, we're going to study the doctrine of that we've adopted as God's son. That's just an amazing chapter. Uh, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. What's amazing, we can say that, Abba, Father, right? Because again, we know that God did not have to treat us as sons. He could have had the king and his subjects, correct? He still could have saved us, but he chose to relate to us that we can cry out, Abba, Father, a term of endearment. The Spirit Himself, capital S, God's Spirit, bears with us, our spirit, small s, that we are children of God. And if children were heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. And isn't that amazing? So it's God's Spirit bears witness with us that we know that, that we are children of God. We have that assurance. We get that from the Spirit. That is direct miraculous work of the Spirit's power to assure us that we are exactly what God has promised us to, uh, that, that we have according to the scriptures. Peter. Yeah, and that the spirit bearing witness with our spirit, it's, I can remember back as a new believer being taught the book of Ephesians and right there in chapter 1, I've been adopted. And there was, that was revelation in itself, but That is the Spirit bearing witness to you and revealing that and assuring you of that, isn't it, as it does with, the, yes, with all of us. Yeah. But again, what a great powerful truth we find in scriptures right here. The Spirit does that. And we all know that we've gone through times or you've talked with people who are wondering, do I, is this real? Am I really saved? And we know that there are, there are some churches out there that teach that you can lose your salvation. What a terrible weight to live under, that wondering, if have, has God withdrawn this from me? Or if I lost his blessing, and it, what happens is we that that is that tr if you hold to that, that will force us into really a works-based faith. Because at the end of the day, we're trying to do everything we can to make sure we haven't sinned enough that we've, that God's withdrawn His blessing and Spirit and His offer of redemption pulled that back from us. And we got to be careful because we can have that assurance, and the very fact we can feel God's con that conviction of the Spirit, knowing that that is the presence of God in our lives. And we can rest in that. Thoughts on that or questions? Yeah. Shouldn't, um, just to be logically consistent, sure. shouldn't all, uh, everyone who's a free will, sort of Armenian type person where they believe they accept, you know, they're the ones who did it. Shouldn't they all believe they could lose it? Because free will is, goes both ways. Yeah. You have the free will to accept it, should have the free yeah. will to reject them. Yeah. yeah. If you, you can, can choose, choose your, your way, way in, then you yeah. can choose your way out, right? And I think there's a difference. Some would say if you choose, it's the willing choice, now I reject it. It may not hold to that I've sinned enough that I can lose it. So I think there's two degrees there. If that Does that make sense? There's a, that willingly choice versus I've done enough sin now that God says, uh-uh, or withdrawn his blessing from me. I think that they would separate the two. There's some would hold to both and some would only hold to, no, it only applies if we willingly reject. And again, some of you maybe come from a, an Arminian background can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that they would hold those two separately and you would find some varying beliefs. Yeah, but you're right. I, it doesn't hold. If you can choose your way in, perhaps could you choose your way out? Yeah, yeah so I, I grew up in an Armenian church. Yeah. Uh, my dad was an Armenian pastor for yeah. 38 years. Um, 
it's at least from my dad's perspective, it's the latter. Okay. Um, it, it was. I know that there are Armenian doctrines that would suggest that if you know that it's sort of a, a, an individual sin by sin, and if you're, you know, my grandma used to say, prayed up, packed up, and ready to go. To them, that meant literally on a sin by sin basis. So if, you know, if I say something mean to you and then die, I go to hell. That's that was not my dad's. That, that was not how he viewed that passage. His they use the term backslidden a lot, yeah. and the concept is is that backslidden is you know not walking with God. But there's a point where you actually say, I don't want any part of this anymore, and that's where the, that choice would come in yeah. to say, because I chose Christ to begin with, I'm now choosing not to to have Christ. Yeah. Therefore, the gift is no longer available. That, that's what my dad preached. Correct, yeah, and that's, that's what, what I meant. There's two I separate said, beliefs. You'll, you'll find, find both, it. I think, in the Arminian world, but I think most would hold to that. But we know that's also out there. People leave. You get to a point threshold where, hey, whether you chose or not, it, it, clearly you're not a follower <laughs> of Christ. And again, we would hold to differently with the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints. That's coming. Last section we're going to study is this. We've talked that the Spirit empowers us. He unifies the church um, and reveals truth to us. And I really like this last section, the Spirit manifests the presence and blessings of God. And Pete, you talked about this in our opening uh, discussion. Many examples in both the Old and New Testament indicate that the Holy Spirit will bestow or withdraw blessing according to whether or not He's pleased by the situation He sees. I thought that was an interesting quote, isn't it? You know, to ponder that for just a moment, is that we can resist the Spirit. And let's talk about what that means. But the Spirit bestows and withdraws blessing according to the situation, whether he's pleased or not with what he sees. Let's you know, think about that for a second, Deb. I think we need to really be careful to understand that that's blessing from God's perspective, not our human, what we think that means. Because that's where you get the prosperity gospel, yeah. right? Is that, yeah. well, if I do this, then God's going to do this for me. And, and what God promises is to be faithful. He doesn't promise us to give us a new car or a new bus or whatever. He actually promises to just bless us. And that can take on many different forms, many of which don't have anything to do with our health, wealth, or welfare. They have to do with being closer to him, and he may bless us by wanting us to be closer to him. He blessed you by asking you to join him in a ministry that he wanted you to be part of, and that's a passion of yours. But for many of us, that wouldn't look like a blessing at all. Because that's right. not our calling. Right. The, the blessing, blessing is obedience, correct? And that, 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 that being in walking in the will of God. I can be blessed by God and lose my job or get that terrible news from the doctor. That has nothing to do with it. And yet we tie those together, right? And there's, a, there's an ugly reality to that that's hard for us to understand sometimes. But anything else becomes a prosperity gospel. And you're going to say, we got to be careful with that. Yeah. You could even consider it a punishment by God getting well. Because, you know, if, you, if that's what you want, sometimes God gives it to you and it destroys your life. Yeah. Yeah. It destroys your marriage. It destroys your whatever. Yeah. Right. Sometimes right. I think I used to love to gamble before I became saved. And I never won. And I thank God every day that I never, you know, I just never won. Because if I had won, I'd have been worse. Yeah. You know? yeah. Right. 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 But, again, we don't see that, do we? And yet our God knows best. Good. And we get angry in the moment because I don't see it because of my selfishness, because of my lack of faith and trust, that I get upset in the moment without trusting in God. And that's, there's the reality. Great, great discussion. Any comment? God, God really turns the world upside down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And sometimes what you think is a curse. Is, yeah. Yeah. It turns out, I had the, the Aurora flood in 96. Yeah. That was the best thing that ever happened to me. Ruined my business. Totally destroyed it. And, and that was when I said, you know what? I, I'm going to try this God thing because I was a total atheist. Hmm. And, and when everything was, I thought everything was gone. It's like, well, I have no hope now. So, you know, 
It was the best thing that ever happened. Yeah, yeah what, what does James, James tell us? Tells? Consider it when what? Trials, yes. Why? Because I tell you what, guys, I'm, not, I'm speaking for all of us. When do we learn our lessons? We learn it through the trials and the hard times because what does it do? It drives us to our knees. And uh, that's, I, I, I wish it wasn't that way, but it is. I do not learn lessons. I learn them the hard way. We all do. It's those trials I look back to where God uses to drive us closer to him. Yeah. Can you go back to your uh, last slide? I think it's important to recognize that the Spirit isn't also just, uh, isn't just, um, you know, checking out each situation and, and uh, picking and choosing here. He's, he is uh, absolutely sovereign, and the Trinity is all at work within 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 each of these situations, and so Good it's point, easy yeah. to it's easy to say, well, you know, the spirit's picking on me in this in this instance, and he's blessing me in this one, right? And it and it, and it be some fleeting or, or or small thing, right? But but uh, the Holy Spirit is also completely sovereign in the, in the decisions that that he makes, and uh, and he's perfect in those decisions. Okay. And I think it's okay. easy for us to separate. You know, as we look at as we've looked at the Trinity, to separate God and Jesus, and uh, or the Father and Jesus, and the and the Holy Spirit kind of takes a back seat, but yeah. He's completely perfect in in, in all of these decisions. Uh, you know, blessing according uh, according to whether or not He is pleased by the by the situation He sees. Yeah, yeah thanks, Josh. All of this never without outside of the umbrella under God's sovereign will and control. Yeah. Absolutely. And it's good. Remember what we talked about in chapter 16. Guys, I know it's 8 o'clock. If you need to leave, give me a few extra minutes. I want to finish. This is our last section. Online, guys, I'm learning. I think we have one hour only in this, so it may cut you off. I apologize to that. I'm working on a better online format. So let's do it. We got some warnings here. Let's go with Stephen in Acts 7, who said, remember, he's on trial knowing he's going to be executed standing before the Pharisees, you stiff-necked people, uncircumcised, calling them uncircumcised. I mean, it doesn't get more offensive or blasphemous to call the Jewish leader at that time uncircumcised in hearts and ears. You always resist the Spirit as your fathers did, and so do you. Um, so they did resist the Spirit. And in Ephesians 4.30, Paul writes, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God behind, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. So we can resist the Spirit, we can, we can grieve the Spirit, we can feel that saying, you know what, you, you, just, you, you know your neighbors are hurt, they got bad news, and you get that sense of, maybe I should go over there. Well, you know what though, I don't really know them, and what if they, what if they don't want to talk to me, or it's awkward, hey, hey, you know what, I can't remember their kid's name, and they're going to, I, I, I feel uncomfortable, I'm not going to do it, right? And we can resist that. That doesn't mean the Spirit is withdrawn completely from our lives, we're still... We, our redemption is secure. We know we're sealed, but we can resist and we can grieve the Spirit. We can sadden the Spirit, meaning that He, he has this for us and we can, we can grieve the sin. We're warned not to grieve the Spirit of God because remember, we are sealed for the day of redemption. That has not changed. But we can grieve the Spirit by our actions when we resist. And I think that's a powerful warning to us as followers of Christ. We can also quench the Spirit. We're warned, don't quench the Spirit. And uh, Grudem, I won't get into it now, goes into kind of what that word quench means. And uh, I'll let you go back to the text to study that. And then we can, all, we can go to Acts chapter 5 with Ananias and Sapphira. And there's some pretty harsh warnings when we, uh, when we disobey, to, to, especially with the, the spirit and heart that Ananias and Sapphira did. And Peter said to her, this is already when her husband's already gone, how is it that you have agreed together, you and your husband, to test the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of those who buried your husband are at the door, and they're going to carry you out too. And they did, and she died. And she lost her life because she tested the Spirit. This gives us warning as a church that there's for a reason. This is serious business, is that when we, uh, when, we, when, we, when we disobey, even to the point where they tried to pull a fast one on the church to, for monetary gain, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a serious business and a harsh warning for us. We can also outrage the Spirit. Let's read this from Hebrews. And the NASB and NIV use insult the Spirit. And, of course, King James Version uh, hath done despite unto. And so it's, uh, <laughs> I had to look up. That was just funny. We do hath done despite unto the Spirit. That's, I love the King James. It's great. And uh, so Hebrews 10, 29. How much worse punishment do you think 
will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the Spirit of grace. It's a harsh warning for the church. And let's continue here just a few verses prior. If we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there is no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury that will consume the adversaries. This is a harsh warning for the church, for those who sit day in and day out to hear the truth and reject fully and completely, because we know in the church today there are those who are coming and coming, hearing the truth day in and day out and have fully and completely rejected. There will not be that sacrifice for sin. There is nothing but the, that the expectation of judgment and a fury that will consume the adversaries. And that has to give us pause, right? Doesn't it? And we're going to get into more of this when we talk about the perseverance of the saints in uh, part five that's coming in the weeks to come. But this is, uh, this is a, uh, these words should give us pause. Yep. It focuses me more on what the Holy Spirit promises to do. Uh, I would like to also see a little bit more of the sin aspect uh, that's grieving the Holy Spirit, but how guilt, shame, and the drive to repentance is also uh, driven by the Holy Spirit. Yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you. you. I'm glad you brought that up too. I, we have all, think, I want everyone to think back. We can go back to times in our life when we were in patterns and habits of sin as followers of Christ. And I, evidence of God's Spirit working in us, thank you for bringing this up, is exactly that. I can go back and tell you I've been at times where I remember just being grieved and shamed to the point of almost of losing sleep. Like just, I was unsettled, knowing what I was doing, shouldn't be doing, and having that just... And, and, and fighting, repenting, and losing that battle, right? There is evidence of the Spirit right there working in our life, to saying, you, <laughs> if, you are, if you are redeemed and sealed, and yet you continue to do this, it's, it's going to be, you, you'll lose that battle. We're, we're not going to win that. Okay. And we're going to lose, and it's going to be painful. And, uh, but I believe that God is, again, this is, we're going to get into the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints, that He will, that we, he will not let us go and that, that uh, redemption, that, uh, that guilt, and that's healthy guilt because what we're doing is wrong and we give that squeeze and you can feel that squeeze on our hearts. That's, uh, that's that, that healthy shame and guilt that drives us back to the Lord. So glad you brought that up. Thank you. Any, th any other thoughts on that? It's hard to keep the focus on this. We want to get to other things, right? It's hard, but we're trying to compartmentalize these. We'll get to that doctrine of the perseverance of the saints. In, in moments like that, you almost... You also see the work of the enemy in those moments, right? When you're when you're stuck in sin and you you know you can't beat it on your own and you keep doing it and you keep doing it and you repent and then you do it again and repent and you do it again. And then you start to think, Well, God doesn't want to hear me repent about this again, right? That's how many times is this and, that, and that's not that's not the spirit, right? Yeah. But that that's someone else at work in your life. Yeah. yeah. And then the spirit reveals to us but the scriptures say if we confess our sins, he's faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And this is where the Spirit reveals truth to us and fights off because, yes, we, we we're naturally going to fall to the lies, um, especially if we're going through a season of not walking with the Lord. It's much easier to fall with, into that. I just outrage the Spirit, outrage God himself. Those are strong words, aren't they? And again, we read the, I, I love, I, I'm glad these, words are in the scriptures and there's been a lot of debate over what this means but i think what we see is a very careful warning to the church especially those who come day in and day out and have said don't want anything to do with it and they they're, they're not they claim to be one of us but aren't and there's a warning there let's go then last what does it mean to blaspheme the spirit matthew writes this therefore i tell you every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven people but, except for the blasphemy against the Spirit, will not be forgiven. And whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. And this was in the context of the Pharisees attributing the powerful work that Christ was doing through the Spirit to our enemy, Satan, uh, to the devil. Uh, Mark 3 writes in Mark 3:29, Whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. I think the context we're talking about here is not just denying the truth, but taking it to another level, claiming to have the truth, and, and attributing this, 
the work that we see, that powerful work to our enemy and denying it, there's very uh, harsh and terrible words for people who do that. There, there is no forgiveness for that. That, that. that redeeming work, that offer of forgiveness will not happen in their lives once they've done that. And they've taken it to a, a, a different level than just uh, rejecting, but taken it to that new level. And again, time doesn't permit us to go into any deeper than that. You can certainly go back to the text uh, if you want to study that more. But again, those are hard words and a hard text, isn't it? Just thoughts or comments on this? It's hard when we think about, wait a minute, that there's no forgiveness. It's just hard to read those words. But in the context, what we find here that it's true that there isn't for that blasphemy against the Spirit uh, in the context that we just stated. And so we see this. Uh, we are commanded to be filled with the Spirit, to walk in the Spirit. Uh, and Paul writes, and don't get drunk with wine, for that's debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. And I'll re we'll read this quote. Uh, to be filled with the Holy Spirit is to be filled with the immediate presence of God Himself. And it therefore will result in feeling what God feels, desiring what God desires, doing what God wants, speaking by God's power, praying and ministering in God's strength, and knowing with the knowledge which God Himself gives. This, I like this definition of what, he's, what it means to walk in the Spirit and to be filled with the Spirit. This is the work of the Spirit. This is the result, what we see. And we know that when we are obedient, this is the fruit that we get in our lives, that, we, that He manifests God's presence and blessings in our life, as we've already defined what those blessings are. Any final thoughts or comments on this? I'm going to go just to pass the questions. There was a great question. If you go back to the first question, uh, it's a really interesting one to, to think through. Uh, but I'll conclude with this. Paul writes to the Corinthian church, Do you not know that you, that we are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells in us? What an amazing truth, isn't it? Is that, uh, that God has sealed us with the Spirit, that the Spirit of God, that power that we read over and over in Scriptures that work in us today, men, and that Spirit of God dwells in us. And what we just read, the, the blessings, again, not material, not in this world, but the blessing that God manifests, those blessings to us, that we know what it is to know God's truth, to walk with the Lord. We, can, we have that power working within us. And I hope that through study of this, that this caused us to give pause and to look at the Spirit, not just this mystical force and wind that kind of blows through, but a member of the Trinity, a triune God, the Spirit is God, and that power that is working within us and the Spirit dwells in us today, even now as followers of Christ. Any questions or comments before we close? Okay, thanks guys. Uh, here we'll do quickly, uh, just I do want to close in prayer. And uh, Pete, any updates for us? I know you had a difficult couple of weeks. Uh, so thanks all for praying for, my, for our family while we, uh, we went through my dad's funeral. Um, it was a celebration of life. He lived 98 years. I was telling him, you know, it, my dad would say, I lived longer than God uh, should have permitted me. And, uh, and he, it was just amazing to listen to the testament of a life well lived uh, from everyone. So it's just, you know, I was telling him, it's just amazing. You know, as dads, we have this incredible privilege to guide our children. And then when they come back and they, they're following the Lord, it's a huge example. But to look back on your dad and know that everyone that was there said the same thing about him. He was a man of God. Mm -hmm. yep. yeah. And our, our separation, separation is very, very temporary. temporary. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, And with my mom. And so that, you know, the, 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 it didn't really hit me until we were standing at the gravesite and I had to look down and see my mom's right next to him. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the celebration, they're, they're together. Their bodies are, are healed. My mom, many of you know my mom suffered from multiple cirrhosis and was a quadriplegic for four years. And dad, she never went into home. Dad cared for her the whole time. And so they're together. Whatever you need, that is. That's, that's awesome. awesome. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else, guys, we can be praying about? Updates? Let me close this in prayer then. Lord, thank you so much again for this, the blessing that is to gather together, to, to read your scripture, to study uh, your spirit. Lord, thank you for the power that your spirit does within our lives, that sealing ministry, that is a guarantee of our inheritance that is to come. Lord, thank you, God, that we can rest in peace that once given, once bestowed, once our eyes are open, that that gift of your salvation 
is not withdrawn. And we can rest in that, to God, in that despite of our own continuing to sin and our pride, to God, that uh, we can come to you for forgiveness and approach your throne of grace with confidence. We can cry out, Abba, Father. Lord, uh, what a blessing that is. God, I ask that your spirit uh, would continue to empower us as you have uh, promised. Lord, I pray that we in this room would not resist your spirit. We would not grieve your spirit. Lord, that we would be obedient, God, so that we can have the blessings, not material, not physical, God, but the blessing of what it is to be obedient, to know you, to know your truth, and to sense your presence uh, every moment of our lives. Lord, continue to grow us, sanctify us. Lord, uh, as we fall, Lord, drive us to our knees. Lord, uh, may we experience guilt and shame until we repent. And we thank you, God, and rejoice that there is mercy, grace, and forgiveness at the cross. Uh, Lord, uh, continue to uh, show us this truth on a daily basis, Lord. And we thank you. We love you. And we pray these things in uh, Christ's name. Amen. Amen. All right. Thanks, guys. Have a great week.